can't make more people off less food, right? Reproduction, reproduction stops under certain body fat percentages. So, so the food always has to be there first. So population growth always follows increases in food production. It always has and always will. Oh, he's, he's here, man. Uh, hey, welcome. Yeah, I just got back from work. Welcome. Yeah, hey, Pano. This is uh, Brian here. Uh, which one? Oh, hello. How are you? Uh, Fair to Midland, as far as I can tell. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. Uh, you, you, you're invited by highly recommended from uh, Daniel, good dude Daniel. So we're uh, Pano and I had Pano Bassa and I had a good conversation. Uh, covered a couple topics. Um, just got a quick feel for uh, hey, this could be interesting in terms of uh, spirituality, uh, the the need or not need of religion and spirituality. Uh, does it play a part in the solution for Western civilization or not? And just some topics there. And so. Um, I don't know if you want to do a bit of an intro on yourself so the audience gets a feel. That might be good. Or if you want to just dive in and start um, going after some hard hard questions and giving – basically, like, what are we really up against and what kind of solutions do you see coming from the spiritual camp um, or not? Yeah, an introduction. Like, how many, how many minutes of an introduction would you request? <laughs> Elevator pitch. I, yeah, elevator pitch, just the quick one. Uh, okay, well, uh, let's see, I was born in Alaska long ago, very early age, and uh, grew up in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, let's see, as a kid, you always expect that uh, parents and your just adults in general know what's what, and you don't know what's what because you're not grown up yet. But uh, by the time I was 13, I was having some serious doubts about that theory. And by the time I was 16, I just realized that the adults were as clueless as I was. And I just went into open rebellion, which led me to being uh, required by my father to see a youth counselor because I was just going wild, almost flunking out of school. And um, it turned out just through karmic coincidence that he was a really wise and spiritual kind of a cool guy who turned me on to books by people like Ram Das, And um, I didn't really understand it very well because it was so alien to everything that I'd been exposed to before that you, you can't really integrate, you know, really new information. But I could just intuitively feel that it was, there was depth to it, you know, there was, there was more to it than just, uh, you know, like living like the the life of a human animal or or just like partying all the time and getting into trouble you know just following along all the fashion trends and all that too so um by the age of 17 i decided i was going to uh renounce the world and become some sort of uh some sort of monk probably um I, really what it boiled down to is you've got these books saying that it is possible to to know ultimate reality in this life and so I figured it was my duty to give it a shot, you know? <laughs> so um, I gave it a shot for about 30 years. I was an ordained Theravada Buddhist monk for about 30 years and most of that time in Burma. And uh, most of my time in Burma, literally living in, in caves, in forests. And um, finally, for various reasons, it just seemed like it was time to come back to America and uh, in America, just living the life of like an ancient Indian ascetic just doesn't work. And so <laughs> after about two years or so of experimenting with just living like in a Burmese temple in California, I just decided it'd probably be best to uh, um, just return to the non-ordained life, which is what I have done. And uh, now I'm uh, working for a living and uh, just uh, experiencing life um it's it's just like a lot of people just see it as just mundane existence but really when you've been a monk for a long time and you just plunge into it it's like this whole this whole world that's kind of interesting you know it's like a, a miracle that you can just walk into the kitchen and fry an egg if you want to which i mean as a monk i mean i wasn't allowed to do anything like that so it's it's really uh 
I, I've really enjoyed it, to tell you the truth. And so here I am, and that leads us to the present moment. And so that's the introduction. Awesome. Yeah, as Philippe said, great intro. Uh, first questions came out. Babyface Nielsen says, what is spirituality? Okay, is that on the like the sidebar or something? Should be a uh, um, yeah um, the com comments in YouTube. Should okay, be, you should be able to see them too, I believe. Oh, okay. No, uh, I see something on the side. Yeah, it has like a little YouTube thing. All right, what is spirituality? Um, my interpretation of spirituality is like trying to get out of the matrix, trying to escape from Plato's cave, trying to. Uh, transcend the illusion and get to ultimate reality whether you succeed or not is um largely irrelevant i think but um uh, uh so long as you're sincerely trying i would say that would be uh spirituality or spiritual would it not include some also some sort of direct experience of the of the numinous i guess of the uh i don't know it's a sort of beatific experience in my experience it's almost tactile does, does that jive with your experience yeah it would be like mysticism yeah i think yeah i mean it's like the only way you can transcend the illusion or you know transcend samsara or you know go beyond the matrix it seems to me would be through some sort of mysticism, which is just uh, direct experience of reality without it being filtered through perceptual symbols. Absolutely. Uh, Philippe asks, what do you think of the concept of diocin? That oh, that's, that's from Hegel, isn't it? I, I assume, I assume I've, I've seen that word is a German word. Um, it just means like, Oh, I'm, I'm not even sure exactly what it means, but Nick, um, Nick, pull up the definition on it. Yeah, uh, I'm doing that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's from Hegel. So, um, you know, there's might be an overlap, uh, Pano, on uh, the 1900s. There was the Christian New Thought and um, Awakened Imagination. So, from my understanding, Buddhism wants to have this like nothing that it's like empty and meaningless right if you do remove all those forms and symbols but if you go to these um folks from christian new thought type stuff where it's imaginative and you create your reality obviously that went all the way through the 50s 60s 70s and uh personal development type stuff even the secret which had been the most modern version of it when you do implant an idea of of living into a future that you desire. So largely Buddhism, you want to have non-attachment and you don't want to have a desire. But in this flip side is that you do have a desire and you create it. And then obviously these people, at least from the t testimonials I've read, you know, they imagine some beautiful home and then within a, a few days or a week or whatever, they find that exact home that they imagined and then they, they buy it for the right amount or whatever this incredible stuff is. Obviously, <laughs> It hasn't been verified aside from their testimonial, but there are there are even in my life I've had things that I cannot explain that have been manifested aside from, you know, I wanted that I and I created that. Where's the connection from uh, uh, this empty and meaningless into awakened imagination and creating exactly what you want in your reality? Which one is the true reality? Okay, well, um, the second part. Um it, it seems more like magic, what, you know, it's like manipulation of samsara, manipulation of the dream, you know, like lucid dreaming or something. So, I mean, that would fall short of like the goal of, of Buddhism, which is just like transcending the whole illusion. That's more like staying in the illusion and manipulating it and sort of having mastery over it, which um, people like Aleister Crowley were really into that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I would say that, um, like true spirituality or, or like the, the main point of Buddhism would be, um, you're, you're, you're simply transcending the whole thing and then it doesn't matter whether you get the house or not, although it can still happen, you know, miracles can still happen. In fact, um, they're more likely to happen the more you detach from just the mainstream normie mindset, but, um, getting back to the, the meaningless and, and, uh, um, empty thing that that goes back to hegel and dasein where um i i really don't have much use for hegel but um 
the one thing that he said that I really have really have liked, I've really taken it to heart, is how he starts his his um I think it's his logic. It's like the dialectic in his logic. You know, it's it's fame Hegel has this famous dialectic where you start with the thesis and then that is opposed by the antithesis, which kind of cancels out the thesis. And so then you have to form a synthesis that um you know it, it sort of makes sense of the two. And his does saying, I remember, I think that is like, I, if I remember correctly, that was his synthesis of his first thesis and his first antithesis. And his first thesis is just pure being. That's how he starts his whole dialectic and his logic. Just the idea of pure being, just infinite, pure, undifferentiated existence. And then he points out with the antithesis that, um, the antithesis is pure non-being, just pure non-existence. And, and he says, he observes that, you know, neither one of these has any kind of determinate content. You know, they're both just so blank and void of any kind of distinctions that they just merge together. You can't tell them apart. So um, he just took it as um, like, like an axiom that pure being and pure non-being are just identical. And then... And, that, and that's something that I really like because it's, you know, it explains how the universe can arise out of nothing because, you know, everything and nothing are ultimately the same. You know, it's just a really convenient way of explaining, you know, why, you know, everything in the universe exists because it has to, everything that's possibly can exist has to exist in order for it to be absolute being, which can then be the same as nothing. But then getting to his, his synthesis, though, I think that's where Desain comes in, where you have to have a distinction between existence and non-existence in order for anything, you know, perceptual to, to exist, you know, for, in order to see anything or to know anything particular, there has to be existence and non-existence, like, butting up against each other with a contrast. There has to be a contrast between existence and non-existence. And uh, I can't remember what Dasein literally means in German, but it it fits into the synthesis of the, the contrast of existence and non-existence that, that causes something to seem to exist, even though ultimately, you know, absolute being and absolute non-being just blend together into the being synonymous. So that, it's interesting. It does sort of work out that um, that reality tends to be a paradox in what you're describing. Is that correct? Well, whenever you're dealing with infinity, paradox is going to always be lurking around the corner somewhere. Yeah. And then, like, ultimate reality would be infinite. It'd be, like, formless infinity. Uh, at least that's what the mystics are saying. And, uh, you know, like, the theistic ones, like the Catholic saints, they're calling it God. And the you know in the Upanishads it's called Brahman and sometimes it's identified as just infinite consciousness, and uh, the Buddhists just have sort of took the flip side of instead of identifying it as infinite being they just call it you know just emptiness, and um, but it, ultimately it's they're essentially trying to describe the same thing, as far as I can tell. And I'm I'm. Uh, downing a, a red bull because i just got off work <laughs> it's the best way to unwind after a hard day <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's in the top 10 anyway no, uh. <laughs> pano i'm just curious um what are some things that you think western civilization got right and where do you think western civilization has gone wrong oh the west um one thing that I don't know if it's genetic or cultural is that Westerners, you know, like the European race, we're, we're extroverted. You know, if we, if we are trying to understand reality, we look outside of us. Whereas in the East, they're more likely to look within themselves to try and understand reality. So that has made us really, um, you know, we invented science pretty much. We became just uh, really just unstoppable with regard to our technology and, and scientific knowledge and so forth. And uh, Western culture has pretty much conquered the world because, I mean, no matter what city you go to, no matter, uh, well, maybe maybe like a, a, a an intensely Muslim city or something, you'll see people wearing like 
um, traditional Muslim clothing, but you go to like communist China, everyone's wearing Western clothes pretty much just anywhere in the world. It's just Western neon signs and you know, Western architecture and Western clothing. And so we've, we pretty much conquered the world um, culturally, even if we didn't do it uh, politically or militarily. So, I mean, with regard to what we did right, I assume, um, you know, we learned really powerful ways of dealing with samsara or dealing with, you know, the shadows on Plato's cave, the walls of the cave, or, you know, manipulating the matrix, that kind of thing. But uh, uh, in some ways, we're, 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 we're kind of like spiritually retarded in the West. We're so extroverted and so inclined to look outwards instead of inwards that uh, a lot of people are just clueless with regard to what they've got inside their own mind. So that would be, that would be one of the main um, upsides and downsides of being a Westerner, I think. Uh, I got another one just in case. <laughs> So, we got some skeptics open. in the chat already. Skeptics. Yeah, well, skeptics is, I mean, true skepticism is good. I mean, in the, the classical sense of suspension of judgment. But uh, just to uh, firmly disbelieve something isn't skepticism at all. You're just, instead of, I mean, if you just firmly disbelieve A, then what you're doing is you're firmly believing not A, which is still not skepticism. Oh, what are all, these are all questions. Having some uh, technical bugs here, trying to work them out over here, but it uh, seems to have reconnected. All right. I think we're okay. I think so, anyway. We got Eli on main screen. Yeah. Now you got me. Frozen to me. Guys, feel free to ask questions. Yeah, I think there are people asking questions here, like what the refugee heretic is asking about the concept of the shadow self where you can embrace it and, and integrate it into yourself or ignore it and hope it doesn't consume you yeah that, that's a good question i think yeah, uh, murray has a lot to say about that where um yeah it is true it's like um you know for, for many years i was trying to be a saint you know trying to eradicate my defilements and so forth and um it, it's easier said than done because you can't have positive without negative you can't have just a coin with one side. So um, there's always going to be some kind of negativity. So long as you've got positivity, like like a Buddhist saint is just neutral. You know, he's not positive or negative. He, he abandons both good and evil. And um, most people just can't do that. Even most monks can't really succeed in just being purely neutral. So you're going to have... Um, some negativity, you know, you're going to have anger and lust and impatience and, and all the rest of it. And so um, for a spiritual person in the West, especially, or anybody who's just living a life that isn't a saintly one, which is most of us, then there has to be a certain stoicism where you accept the reality of karma that, you know, if you're doing non-saintly things, there's going to be a certain amount of negative stuff happening back to you. Um, and so you just... Um, adopt a kind of stoic toughness where you just uh, practice or cultivate the ability to to accept you know the the shit hitting the fan with with some equanimity and fortitude and i think that's gonna that would be a really important quality for anybody to cultivate especially when things are starting to to go sour in 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 the culture where uh, things are more likely to get worse instead of better for the foreseeable future so just being able to accept um, the the negative consequences of our own negativity um, with with a certain amount of equanimity and fortitude as much as we can muster i think that would be like a really fundamental to any kind of spiritual practice for a, a person living a worldly life ah, let's see are, are we supposed to be answering these questions on the sidebar here yeah, and uh, Philippe says, I saw your Out of Africa Evolution Theory video. Please explain. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was I was having a debate with Brian Rue, who uh, I think he thinks that uh, we're, we're put here by aliens or something. But, um, 
Yeah, there's there's like two different out of Africa theories. There's like the big out of Africa theory and the little out of Africa theory. The big out of Africa theory is just that uh, our ancestors, um, you know, like the hominids, you know, the earliest, you know, members of the genus Homo uh, evolved in Africa. And, uh, you know, they're saying it would be like Eastern Africa, like Homo habilis, you know, like, I don't know, four million years ago or something, you know, from Australopithecus and so forth, that all of that sort of thing was happening mainly in Africa. And then there's the, the little out of Africa theory, which is what most people are talking about. And that's the idea that Homo sapiens um, evolved in Africa and then migrated out of Africa into Asia and Europe and everywhere else. And it apparently happened in two main waves. There was like an, or maybe three, because there was supposedly a really early wave before 70,000 years ago. And then there was what was called the Toba catastrophe where this huge super volcano in what is um, now Sumatra exploded and killed off almost the, the whole human race. It caused like a nuclear winter. And um, so, almost all the people outside of Africa, according to the theory, died off. And so then around 70,000 years ago, you had a, a wave of people that were closely related to Australian Aborigines that migrated out of northeastern Africa and across South Asia and finally made it to Australia. And there are still some Australoid people in South Asia that, uh, you know, the ancestors, their ancestors didn't make it all the way to Australia. And um, then I think it was like uh, something like 40,000 years ago, there was another wave of, um, you know, like, you, you got to use politically incorrect speech, I suppose. They had like a higher IQ or that for some reason they were, they were better able to compete. And so they pretty much outcompeted all the proto-Australoids everywhere except for Australia, which they didn't reach. And maybe some of the islands around Australia. So that would be like the, the, like the small out of Africa theory. But there are some people who think that um, you know, Homo sapiens evolved kind of independently in different places just from Homo erectus. So uh, the issue with that is that Australoids have some Asian genes. Excuse me. Uh, the issue with that is that Australoids have some asian admixture uh oh okay like like before they got to australia they were already mixing with i mean i think they've got some kind of denisovan yeah that too dna in them so yeah i wouldn't be able to explain that based on that theory if no. if um yeah i mean if if they were already crossbreeding with like the ancestors of the uh um like the what would you call it, the mongoloid race, the you know, East Asians or something, then yeah, that would uh, really uh, kind of mess with the theory, wouldn't it? Yeah, it was something I've seen just today. There was there were apparently Australoids in America before the Amerindian population reached there. Oh uh, yeah, there was um there's I've seen a couple of theories to account for that. One is when the, they migrated across South Asia. Then they, they, some of them were migrating up like the east coast of Asia and may have made it across the Bering Land Bridge. Or I think maybe a more likely explanation is that you had the Polynesians and other related peoples who were making it to South America um, over the water. And they may have been interbreeding with Australoids or proto-Australoids so that that would cause like Australoid DNA to be in South American populations. Maybe not pure blooded Australoids got there, but people with some Australoid ancestry may have gotten there. But I'm, I'm not not really an anthropologist. It's just interesting theories. I, th I do think it's very interesting. Let's see, Greek Opithecus Freibergi. <laughs> joke or not <laughs> yeah well i mean it's it's hard to say exactly what the truth is and um i mean it could be that it's that far back um there could be just multiple paths multiple futures we're just we're just sort of 
sticking ourselves into the idea that there's like this one objective past this one objective timeline that we are going that we have gone through to reach the certain you know the present moment that we're all in the same reality or the same version of reality and that there's only going to be one future also but that's not necessarily the case and i think the farther you get away from the present moment just the more vague and gray and uh, impossible to really explain it, it things get this is the uh, greco i can't even say grescoscopist framework oldest living hominid in europe on africa yeah hominin yeah although it may not be have been one of our ancestors yeah they, there were like um you know relatively advanced apes that were you know found like ramapithecus was in india i think what are the political implications of the out of africa theory um i don't think there's ne should necessarily be any political implications although um some people that uh, are really down on Africans would say, you know, or maybe, or a lot of Africans too would just say, you know, the first true humans were black. And and um, and then of course, you know, the opposite camp is saying, no way were the first true humans black. But um, I mean, the, like the, the Negroid race didn't even exist until relatively recently. So they would have been more closely related to like um, the African Bushmen and the, the uh, like, like I said, the, the Australoids. So yeah, I don't think there's necessarily any political significance to it. It's just, um, you know, it's scientific theories that uh, can be politicized, but not necessarily. It seems the implication would be that people are politicizing them as uh, race relations become more strained in the United States, I think was the implication. If I read that right. Yeah, something like that. Although it's it's based on like a misunderstanding of of the case because really at forty thousand or seventy thousand years ago I'm pretty sure there was no black race yet. You know there was what was called the Bantu expansion, which was I mean it was still occurring in historical times even like when uh, the the Dutch made it to South Africa the black the black race hadn't fully expanded into South Africa yet. So it was still mostly. Um, what the Khoisan people still living there. Uh, something about giant skeletons. Yeah, I, I have no idea about giant skeletons. Uh, oh, yeah, the, this one, they said, um, so he said, you asked that question, have you ever heard of giant skeletons, says Boomy. Uh, Ulfric says, yeah, Boomy, they're, quote, tall, red-headed giants. Native Americans talked about them quite a bit. I had read somewhere that uh, museums were caught destroying some of their giant uh, skeleton remains. I don't know if they necessarily destroyed them or handed them to their wealthy patrons or whatever, but apparently they're out there. I have seen some photos. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, well, photos are you know, photos can be faked really easily, and and again, it's like um, I've had these kind of. Um, debates with uh, my friend Brian Rue, who, who just, you know, like aliens are responsible for pretty much everything. Um, I do think that uh, it's, it's how, how I put it, that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really a materialist. So I don't necessarily follow the idea that, uh, you know, just because you find a giant skeleton, that there necessarily was a giant human being that in, in a lot of these cases, the skeletons are so big that, uh, you know, they'd be defying uh, physics as we know it because they'd just be too too heavy to support their own weight. You know, some of them are so huge. So it could just be that uh, just the, the human mind or some sort of paranormal event just causes weird things to manifest, you know, where you can get like a, a radio or something encased in, you know, a million year old vein of coal, that kind of thing. Just all kinds of weird, inexplicable things happen in this world. And um, I think that uh, a lot of it is just, uh, just kind of like glitches in the matrix. That there just can be like anomalies that occur that aren't necessarily based on any kind of objective event in the path. Um, I don't know if we're going to stick to the hour and a half or we're going to go a little bit longer, but I do want to get a question in on like spirituality and solutions. 
the Good News Show for more than 100 episodes, we usually focus on solutions. So have you given thought to how we make our way out of this clown world with parasitic elites pulling levers and pushing propaganda and causing hell for most normal humans? <laughs> well, for starters, I'd say that pretty much since we got civilized, it's always been this way. You know, I mean, there's been like parasitic oppressive governments from ever since governments got invented, I'm pretty sure. You know, it's just talking about the good old days. I mean, maybe the, the 80s and 90s were kind of an, um, an exception to the rule. You know, there, things were going pretty well back then. But uh, as a general rule on, for human beings, I mean, it's like uh, for things to suck is uh, more normal, I think. Um, with regard to surviving it, I, I do think that it may take things to get a lot worse just because of the, the cycle of history. You know, it's like good times make weak men and weak men make bad times and bad times make strong men and the strong men make good times. So we may just have to have enough bad times to toughen up enough people that uh, things are going to reset. Makes sense to me. Is there any <laughs> Spiritual, sorry, is there any particular spiritual practice that you think could help people become more mindful or um, see, maybe get get in their bodies or the balancing? Uh, I think you said the shadow self. Maybe there's a couple things that um, could help people <laughs> uh, in become strong men uh, or uh, make make their way to making uh that we could get through it maybe a little bit sooner or more yeah. through the time yeah i think so i mean some of the teachings of buddhism um really are helpful like for example the first no or the second noble truth the first noble truth is if you exist you're going to be unhappy you know it's just there's you're, you're never going to you're just not going to be happy all the time you're never going to be completely 100 percent satisfied and then the second noble truth is that unhappiness is caused by desire it's whenever you're unhappy it's because you want something and that desire is volitional for most people you know they're just kind of running on autopilot it's just habits running their life and so they don't really examine their own mind they don't examine themselves so they just assume that if they're unhappy it's somebody else's fault and like the left is like you know they got it's, it's largely based on that whole idea you know if you're unhappy you know blame whitey or whatever but really, that's one thing that any wise person should um, consider is that uh, whether you're happy or not is really your choice. It's a matter of your own attitude. And for people just to, uh, you know, develop a little stoicism, just to be able to accept adverse circumstances and not be just like fighting against reality all the time, because reality is always going to win. Just, you know, if things aren't the way you like, then, I mean, you can complain about it and blame somebody, but uh, that's just going to make you even more unhappy. It's just going to spread more unhappiness. So just accept that um, you don't like it, and that's just, that's your issue. And just, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of similar to what the Stoics were teaching a long time ago um, in, the, in the West. And... Um, Unfortunately, all that kind of thing pretty much got wiped out when Christianity became the uh, the monopoly religion of the West. But um, yeah, that would be one. Just just realize that whenever you're unhappy, it's because you have chosen um, to want things to be different than they are. It might might have been a subconscious choice, but uh, if you examine your own mind enough, then you can bring it up to the level of consciousness. I, w I would add that as well to tack on to what you said, though, about the attachment. It's also not just attachment to material things or such, but it's also attachment to certain outcomes, right? So that's a, as much a part of it as materialism, right? Yeah, it can be attachment to anything. You can, uh, like in, uh, in Buddhism, they say they're, they're, traditional Buddhism says there's three kinds of desire. There's desire for sensual pleasures, there's desire for existence, and then there's desire for non-existence. So even just... Um, clinging to the idea of, of wanting to transcend the illusion. I mean, it's still clinging. It's still, you're not accepting that you're in the illusion now. So it's, it's just, it's all the same principle.
Uh, I was going to say that stoicism is different in that it doesn't just teach to ac ac accept the situation, but first differentiate what's under your control and what isn't. And if it's under your control, go ahead and change it. Yeah. Well, I mean, even if something happens, I mean, accepting the situation doesn't mean that you just um, you just don't change anything or do anything. Like you're driving down the road and your car gets a flat tire. You don't just pull over and say, well, I accept that the tire is flat. I'll just, you know, sit here. You know, you just, okay, I accept that the tire is flat and now I accept that the thing to do is to get out and change the tire. You know, that would be the, the approach to take, I think. So I, accepting the situation doesn't necessarily mean that you don't do anything about it. You just accept that this is the way things are and now the appropriate action to take is this and then you just do that right. as well as you are able. Is desire always bad though? Um, ultimately, ultimately, yes. Although you can use it sort of like fighting fire with fire. So. Um, like in, in Buddhism or, you know, just about any, um, relatively advanced spiritual, um, system, you know, it's like you renounce everything except you're, you're striving for enlightenment. So you, you, you cut away all these attachments and desires, but you still have this one, you know, the desire for, des the desire for enlightenment. And then eventually, um, Eventually, it's like you try as hard as you can. You try and try and try, and you can't do it. And then finally, you realize that your last obstacle is this one last desire for enlightenment. So you have to let go even of that. And and then, you know, the miracle happens or whatever. Cool. So how do we, how do we leverage that um, it, without compromising the Westerners' uh, extroversion? We don't want to. We don't want to undermine that extroversion. Like I said, it's it's brought us a lot of the things we enjoy today. <laughs> but we we want to help you know instill that perpetual sense of self ownership in people, right? What we call mindfulness or, or spirituality, right? Just uh, whatever conditions exist, own them as fully as you can, right? So how do we yeah. build that into I don't know ritual or, or or expression or things that we can teach others to do without compromising? That that Western um, extroversion that that we that you talked about earlier. Well, I mean, just uh, getting the point across that uh, um, you know there is a whole new dimension uh, by looking inwards. Um, um, I mean, I don't think there's necessarily a conflict between um, you know looking outwards and inwards. I mean, sometimes it's appropriate to look outwards. You know, like you're driving a car or something. Sometimes it's appropriate to look inwards, and so. Um, you know, people in the West need to cultivate the inwards part more. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily, you know, you're not uh, abandoning the outwards aspect of it, but um, it certainly is, is helpful to, uh, I mean, probably more important ultimately if you're trying to, um, trying to cultivate wisdom. Um, and then I, I forgot the other part of your question. Sorry. Oh, no, I'm just, we're, I'm trying to come up with, you know, we, we want some, at the end of the day, we, we want to try to find some practices to help yeah. keep, keep to help, to help to prevent the cycle from repeating itself, right? We don't want people to keep slipping back into being weak men, right? Yeah. And, and whether that's, you know, a, a higher level of asceticism that we all accept into our worlds or whether that's, you know, a, a different frame for how we perceive uh, self-ownership, whatever that needs to look like. You know, how, how do we incorporate that into the Western mindset? Right, where they they are Westerners are consumers, right? They they do have a sense of of possession. So how do we do we how do we leverage the 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 stoicism that we're talking about and the mindfulness that we're talking about into that into what already exists? Do we have to force a change in the Western mindset, or can we adapt the 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 frame into what exists in the the Western mindset? Well, the people in the West have. You know they have accepted uh relatively spiritual approaches before you know right. like we've already mentioned the stoics and and also just christianity i mean it, it's uh not necessarily the ideal approach to take in the west but uh it was pretty much the only approach in the west for about a thousand years and uh 
I mean, there, there are some good aspects of it, just promoting morality and self-restraint, self-control. That requires a certain amount of introspection right there. You know, when you're told, you know, don't be lustful and all this kind of a thing, then you have to have some self-awareness just to be able to, uh, you know, even to try to uh, keep your emotions under control, that sort of thing. So um, just like a framework of any kind of, um, any kind of relatively good, you know, moral system um, or in a philosophical system, I suppose, um, that would be good just as a, a starting framework. And then just getting the point across that whether you're happy or not really depends on your own attitude rather than external circumstances. Then, uh, I mean, once, if everybody wants to be happy, you know, it's like everybody in the world wants to be happy, I'm pretty sure. And um, so, I mean, if you just get the point across that if you really want to be happy, then you're going to have to uh, examine your own mental processes to some degree, because we're, I'm, like I said before, we're, we're pretty much running on autopilot and, you know, just our habits, our habitual reactions to, to, you know, the same kind of events just happen over and over again. And we just reinforce that by, by just doing it over and over again, just running, wearing these grooves into our brain. So, um, yeah, I think for a lot of people, it's just they're going to have to reach a point where this, they're just so unhappy that they just have to make a change. And then it's much easier to uh, advise them. You know, once once they uh, reach this point where it's just it's just not working anymore, then it's it's much easier to uh, to guide or advise somebody. And that's just built into the, the human race. I read this really interesting book called um, Battle for the Mind by William Sargent. And he points out that this is how like Chinese brainwashing or thought reform works. And a lot of spiritual um, spiritual movements started this way. Military basic training works this way. A lot of manhood rituals um, like in, in um, pre-modern tribes work this way where, uh, you know, we're just creatures of habit. We're just pretty much stuck being who, who we are until we reach this crisis stage where things just aren't working anymore you know our, our habitual way of dealing with reality just can't cope with the situation and then we kind of have a breakdown and then we become very open to suggestion and that's when the you know the thought reform you know the commissar steps in and you know you know tells you what to think or whatever or like in stalinist um the soviet union they could get you not only to confess to trying to overthrow the government but, but actually believe that you were trying to overthrow the government and uh you know military basic training you know they just you know you, everything you do is wrong and you got the the drill sergeant yelling in your face until finally you just kind of break down and then he just rebuilds you into this fighting machine that answers that just obeys orders without question or hesitation this kind of thing so uh i'm not exactly sure how i got into that one but um that there could be some of that it's just uh, we're just uh, a lot of people are just going to have to get to this crisis point where there's going to be like a, a major change. Although hopefully it won't be too bad. This was kind of your thing, right, uh, Martin, about how the uh, pursuit of happiness was a bit of a psyop. Well, yeah, because happiness and all other emotions are just measurements. Like, are you going to pursue a measurement? You want to pursue something that it measures, right? And people that just pursue happiness for its own sake just end up addicted to drugs and porn and whatever. Yeah, yeah well, everybody wants to be happy, but most people, uh, they really don't know how to go about it. So a lot of people, like, sort of at the cruder level, it's just physical pleasure, which would be where the, the food and the sex and the the drugs and, and that sort of thing come in. And then uh, as you cultivate wisdom, it's like uh, your concept of happiness evolves and uh, gets refined. So, um, you know, just sort of a, a contentment, just the, the ability to accept whatever happens would be like a higher level of happiness than uh, just uh, wallowing in pleasure. Because pleasure, um, you know, opposites, you know, it's pleasure is just like one side of the coin you know, it's the positive and there's going to be the negative that, that balances it out in the long run. So um, people keep trying for pleasure and then they get pleasure, but then it has negative consequences, which counteracts the pleasure. 
and it just causes like a, the Sisyphus thing trying to pu push the rock up the hill and it's just uh, it's just never ending and they keep trying and trying and trying to be happy and then the bad things keep happening largely as consequences of, of what they've been doing to be happy and um, they just really never never put it together or figure it out but if, right. if you want to have sensual pleasure then you really should have some uh, stoic uh, ability to accept when when the negative inevitably happens also yeah I mean even when they know what they want to pursue it's reasonable goal and they get it then they're surprised that after a while they're no longer happy now that that is exactly how it's supposed to work your mind yeah. is to adapt to new circumstances yeah like a lot of activists are kind of that way like feminists or environmentalists or, or whatever um if if they got everything that they were fighting for they might be all deliriously happy for a few days and grinning at each other and slapping each other on the shoulder and all that but then after a while they'd start getting bored and then they'd have to find something else to to be activists for because it's really the struggle that, that that they that they need there are a lot of people they're they're insensitive in a certain way so it's like if it's like a hand that if it isn't touching anything some people just can't feel their own hand unless it's actually handling something and then there's some people they can't feel really alive unless they're like struggling against something and pushing against something so a lot of activists are like that and they think that they're they're trying to make the, the world better or anything but really they're just trying to feel alive i think not all of them, but but quite a few of them. Yeah, I like to I like to make the distinction between um, active states of mindfulness and passive states of mindfulness, and I think happy happiness kind of falls squarely in that that passive state of mindfulness where it's a reaction or a response or a description of of, of a response. Whereas I think a more accurate, a more active or an accurate way to describe what what we're pursuing is fulfillment. And when you're when you're achieving or expressing fulfillment, it doesn't inherently mean happiness. You can be, you know, experiencing a moment of displeasure and still be in that state of fulfillment because you're achieving or pursuing, you know, the the, the state of goal, the, the goals that you're aimed at. So, so I think that that you know, happiness is kind of the the child's word for fulfillment. They don't have the nuance of it yet. So, yeah, I think like the highest happiness would have no opposite. You know, it'd be largely a, a, a state of neutrality, like uh, equanimity. Well, that's Epicure Epicureanism, right? Yeah. The distinction, I mean, people blamed Epicurus for hedonism, but really he pursued calmness just be, being happy with what you have instead of acquiring more and sensual pleasures yeah i think epicurus the founder of the the philosophical school he he believed in uh moderation and then yeah. i think uh, a lot of his followers just kind of um, became uh, hedonist or something yeah he wasn't really all that different from the stakes when they actually look at the philosophies yeah although i think the epicureans were more atheistic um in a way they're kind of like buddhists where they acknowledge that there are superhuman beings in this universe but uh, the superhuman beings have got their own lives to live and don't really care what we're doing <laughs> so it was sort of a functional uh, atheism that they had going whereas i'm pretty sure the stoics uh they they were i think they were largely monotheistic i mean they, they accepted the the classical gods as sort of higher beings but still i think they did believe in like a um like a like one like the good or or something like that although i'm, I'm no authority on the stoics I, i'm more interested in the cynics to tell you the truth yeah, i remember epictetus talking about zeus in particular most of the time and ignoring the other gods yeah yeah yeah, a lot of like the Neoplatonists, I think they would just take the, the highest god and call it Zeus sometimes. So from your perspective of, of stepping out of Western society and stepping back into it, do you think uh, a more effective approach would be to, I don't know, I guess engage sympathetically with the West or 
it oppositionally with the West as far as trying to cross the, the, the mind barrier with some of this stuff? Do we want to do you want to be friendly about it and ease them into it, or do we want to confront them and, and try to push them into it? Which do you think would work better in the West? Gosh, that, that's a good question. Maybe a little bit of both. Maybe you can try both and see which works better. <laughs> but I mean, we're, if, we're, I mean, if they're too confrontational, it's not going to work. It's like you know, basic strategy like Sun Tzu. You know, it's just a, a full frontal confrontation is probably the most foolish way of of going about. Um, you know, like conquering somebody or, or convincing somebody. So there, there should be some subtlety in uh, going at it in, from an indirect angle. Right. Because uh, if you're just if you're just ranting, you know, about how somebody is wrong, then all it does is just harden them against you. So um, I, I think it's good to adopt as much Westernism as we can. You know, we are Westerners. We think like Westerners. Even when I was living in Burma in a cave, I mean, I'd still have like Led Zeppelin playing in my mind. You know, <laughs> remembering some episode of Gilligan's Island or something. You, you can't just become an Easterner by outwardly following an Eastern tradition. So we're just stuck being Westerners and we think like Westerners. So we should emphasize the best aspects of Western culture, I think. And we've done it before. I mean, we, Western culture has been very strong and healthy, has had a lot of vitality. So this may be trying to uh, return to some of that would be, would be a good approach to take. We're just attacking it and trying to tear it down. I mean, that's what the left is doing, and uh, I don't think it's, it's going to end well. Let's see. No, no questions that I see. As you, I don't know how how much you pay attention to to the news and, and, and politics and stuff like that. But as you're watching these things, what uh, kind of indicators, you know, ba just based on your experiences, what kind of indicators do you look at and go, "Oh, that's kind of scary." I don't, I don't know. I, I don't like, I don't like hearing that or seeing that from from, from the, the 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 spiritual side of of, of your experiences. Oh, what, are, what, are, what are your red flags? <laughs> well. I remember I, I got red pilled, as they call it, like around early 2016, and uh, I was just watching YouTube videos for like three days in this trance of amazement and horror because I really hadn't been paying attention to politics or you know Western culture very much, and then all of a sudden it's like uh, for some reason um, Donald Trump just caused the cockroaches to come out in the broad daylight. Just everything became so obvious. You know, it's like the the subtlety was just thrown out the window. They were just, it was just like this mass hysteria. Just, you know, do anything to get rid of this guy because he's not one of us. You know, he's not a globalist. He's not playing the game or whatever. And, um, yeah, that, I mean, that was, I mean, I wouldn't call it, I was afraid, but it was, it was definitely just, uh, Man, it was it was like pretty much horrifying, you know. Just wow, this is it's like you know, cyberpunk dystopia has 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 like reached um, like empirical reality stage or something. But um, yeah, just the whole idea of you know what the globalists are doing to try to control the thought of of everybody and so forth. But um, like like I said before, it's, it is kind of a comforting thought to realize that I mean it's always been this way. You know, they, 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 some of the methods have changed. You know, there's the internet now, but you know, a thousand years ago, it was uh, the Catholic Church and uh, the the priests delivering their sermons on at the pulpit. You know, was it was pretty much the equivalent of TV and internet. You know, it's just the the way of disseminating information to to the masses. You know, so um, yeah, I, I an another kind of comforting thought is I do believe in in karma. You know, the Buddhist idea of karma. So um, I don't think that uh, we have karma bad enough in general to for things to really get awful. You know, for like you know something or really Orwellian. But um, still, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, like one of the commentators was talking about, that's that comes closer to what what we're uh, heading towards using like addiction to pleasure as, and just uh just the human sheep-like 
conformity instinct as a way of keeping everyone under control rather than, uh, you know, like, um, um, you know, Gestapo agents pounding on doors in the middle of the night. Although I'm sure they would uh, resort to that if they thought it would be uh, um, effective. Absolutely. I believe in karma only insofar we have to act it out. If somebody has bad karma, then we have to punish him. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Although from from the Buddhist perspective, karma is uh, volition. It's the the Pali word is chetana, and uh, volition is maybe not the best translation. It's it's it probably comes closer to Schopenhauer's idea of will. That would be what karma is. So it's sort of like the the mental momentum, the, the momentum of our of our mental processes, and. Um, you know, in a way, from the Buddhist point of view, we're we're kind of dreaming our life as we go along, and so um, the better the better your mental states are, the better of a life you're going to dream for yourself. And uh, if you get punished, then uh, yeah, that's your karma too. But if you punish, the, if you have to punish people that are doing bad things, at least you shouldn't be motivated by hatred or anger or revenge or anything like that. It's just a way of uh, protecting the populace, you know, doing what has to be done, that sort of thing. Hey, let's catch this question before it goes off the screen, because Refugee Heretic asked it twice. What do you suppose would be a good practice or two to promote good, strong men to avoid weak man, strong man paradigm that we're trapped in presently? Hmm. A good practice or two to promote good strong men well I, I do think that uh, just promoting traditional masculine virtues you know just like fearlessness or or like uh, unflinching determination or austerity or love of a good challenge that uh, somehow if you could get an, uh, a group or a movement going that would promote that although of course nowadays they'd immediately be attacked for promoting toxic masculinity or you know some something along those lines but um yeah i think that would that would definitely be a, a good idea and um just promoting a certain amount of stoic toughness of mind and so, so you're not just like whimpering and blaming somebody else when when you're unhappy you just take responsibility for your own for your own happiness and unhappiness You know, um, I do that over overall an entire civilization. Of course, that's uh, that's beyond my capacity. Yeah, those are those are pretty good. It's it's funny that you brought up the choice. I I've had this kind of phrase that it could have been so much better. That was the phrase. It could have been so much better with like ex girlfriends. Like, could have she could have went out the front door and broke up like honestly versus cheating and. There's other things, and that that was the phrase. It could have been so much better. So, that's um, it's interesting when you bring that up of desire and unhappiness because we we want reality to be a different way. Like I even want my past to be a different way. That's that's how much I can get wound up into it, and I particularly get frustrated with the path of America because I feel that humanity had has had so many opportunities to reach further into godhood. So just a quick quick examples would be like civil war was obviously bullshit because the founding fathers even talked that if the colonies didn't like it or it didn't work out, they could secede, they could separate again. But somehow that wasn't codified in the constitution. So the South wasn't able to secede and it turned into a fucking war, right? Uh, you have um, 19 prior to the great war or World War One. Uh, America largely was non-interventionist. Even Woodrow Wilson ran on a policy campaign promise of non-intervention, but somehow we fucking get sucked into World War I. So again, this pathway of here's humanity, especially American, Western, and there were so many times we could have been on the right path, and it feels like to me that the elites and those creating machinations and building up obviously bad karma have suppressed humanity has suppressed that godhood same that you do see in the bible like in the uh, tower of babel we scattered them amongst the earth and confused their language lest they become as us 
they become as gods. So maybe that ties into your comment that it's it's always been this way since the advent of civilization, where you have this suppression of a natural instinct to become more as God or to become godly. Yeah, I read an interesting book called The 10,000 Year Explosion, talking about how human evolution sped up ever since the agricultural revolution. And I am pretty sure, if I remember correctly, that's the book that I was reading that said that uh, since then, we humans have been evolving more along the lines of domesticated animals. You know, when we were hunter gatherers, we were kind of like wild, we we're, you know, like wolves or something. You know, was, we were still a social animal, but still we were um, going along the route of, you know, like a wild animal in nature. Whereas um, as soon as we had stable, you know, like urban communities, agricultural communities, then of course you're going to have kings and you're going to have armies and so forth that uh, human beings in general just began becoming like a domesticated animal. And, um, you know, like kings in the old days, you know, they would treat the population the way a farmer treats his livestock. And so that's kind of, you know, in a way it's just uh, the spine has been bred out of us to some degree. And, uh, Probably, you know, it's like the most violent people, you know, the people that, that like fighting wars the most, the, the actual fighting part, you know, they're, they're the ones that are getting killed off and not reproducing. And it's the, the coward staying at home that, that has the babies. So, um, yeah, that's, it, that's kind of a tough one. But uh, speaking about wanting to change your past, though, that, that did remind me that uh, – that's, that's another teaching of Buddhism that I've really taken to heart and then that regret is always bad karma. It's like being, ag being against something that happened in the past, you know, just I wish it was different or whatever. I mean, it's just wasted on happiness and it's all volitional. You can ultimately decide whether you're going to accept it or reject it. And so you can't be changed, so you might as well just let it go. And if you've done something wrong, just acknowledge you did something wrong and uh you know try to do better next time instead of just oh you know it's it's so awful because I've, I've met a lot of people that some of them are like serious meditators and so forth but there's something happened in their life where they made some kind of totally innocent decision maybe but it wound up causing some kind of accident you know it's like they didn't want to they didn't want to drive somebody to work that day and then the, the person got in an accident and died or something and they're just like kicking themselves for the rest of their lives over this sort of thing whereas uh you know something if, if you've done something bad just uh, acknowledge you did something bad and just try to do better next time it's the best you can do because any kind of regret or remorse from the buddhist perspective is always just making things worse it doesn't it doesn't really make anything better at least uh the, the overall balance is going to be more negative than positive. Let's counter that. We got five, I think we've got five minutes left. We might be able to go, but I, I think we should try to keep this a bit tight. And if the audience would like to have you come back on, throw a bunch of comments on there to have Pano back and we happily bring them back. Uh, so the question is, how about a, in a, a grudge? a grudge so big <laughs> that it was eternal and we cast that as uh, I guess it's in, it's in the Bible as well as God commands you to hate evil right so we have this eternal grudge against these psychopathic bastards that have constantly been pushing down humanity they have their bad karma that has been accumulating nobody so far is taking them to task and punishing them if if we do get to that stage of being able to punish these psychopathic parasitic sadistic elites how about we continue with an eternal grudge with any of their descendants forever well the way it usually works i mean you look, you just read history you know you have the 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 oppressive elite who they do get overthrown and then the people who overthrow them might be good for a generation or two, and then they become the oppressive elite, and then they eventually get overthrown. And then this is power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so, uh, yeah, I think it just, I think we might be largely stuck with, with that sort of pattern until there's some sort of really profound paradigm shift in the human race that uh, kicks us into a higher level of consciousness. Like, well, one of, one like of the making, things, like making the law sovereign. There you go. Go ahead, Brandon. Well, 
Uh, firstly, thank you, Pano. You were an excellent guest, better than expect uh, expectations. Uh, and it was a pleasure. And I was in the background most of the time there because we didn't all fit on the screen and my OCD was going like, out of control when there was one <laughs> little box yeah, on the left and I was sitting here and I couldn't pay attention to anything but the disconcordance on the screen. So <laughs> <clears throat> I apologize for my face not being on the side. The, you said that uh, humans have been evolving into more herd-like animals, uh, cattle, uh, which means that the maneuver is to treat them like kings used to and just go harder at it because it worked better firstly and it brought us to better places. And now they're more fit for their role as domesticated animals. Uh, you just have to pen them up right. Uh, the problem is we have poorly constructed doggy daycares. And going back to uh, Going back to having some people what rewild that would be becoming more pack like or more like wolves is the exact metaphor uh, that that we're dealing with. So I, I thought this went excellently, and we only have to target the conspicuous convenience consumers. They're the only they're the only problem people, and they do it on purpose. Uh, other targeting them exposes their elites, the ones who are pulling their strings. So we're in an excellent position. And this is the first time in history, ever throughout history, that we would be able to reverse any of those trends that we've talked about the whole episode now, where we're stuck in it. We're not stuck in it anymore. You can meet someone like you who is actually authentic and honest and thinks for themselves and is educated across domains and arenas. It's not, it can happen in an instant. So I don't know, welcome. And I don't know what you do for a living, but I could get you teaching people in like 12 months. Oh, that's nice. Right now I'm working in a sheet metal shop. <laughs> oh my goodness. I can give you sheet metal work too. <laughs> yeah, yet another valuable skill. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really had no experience at all working in a sheet metal shop. I think the guy, he was, he was uh, just a genuinely good guy who wanted to, to help me out and uh, let me uh, kind of get get started in life again. Because, I mean, literally, I was a monk for 30 years. So uh, either that or, or he just had a lot of problems with uh, unstable wild guys who didn't stay there for very long. And he just figured I'd have uh, settled ways, you know. <laughs> I do want to bring up one point on the the uh, remorse of the past, right? And I I only bring it up because I, it's been my experience that uh, some of the people in, in some of the new age circles I grew up with they use that let it go as an excuse for their behavior. And I guess my my nuanced point here is that if you're still repeating the same behaviors, it's not the past. So yeah, <laughs> the regret I might not be ill fitting. I, I can give you a little bit more because I was irritated about the whole, uh, irritated about people focusing on the past for a while. It like, weighs on me. Uh, you're not you're not a narrator. Like you don't get to sit down and write the novel. <laughs> you're a narrator. Like you got to do it in the present right now, and you don't have another go at it. Right. And like that's it's a it's a performance for sure because you don't get to perform again. A, you don't get to repeat it. So feeling bad that you performed poorly in the past is only what it only makes you more likely to perform poorly in the future. Right. Yeah. If you're not, if you're not using it to update how you're performing now, then yes, that is the cycle you're falling into. Well, I, I will also clarify that largely it's, it's, it could have been so much better is a complaint on their behavior. Right. Yes, I could have done something, but it's more like they were an immoral whore or they were a uh, controlling, cheating piece of shit person. <laughs> it's more that than it yeah. is. Yeah. I yes, I could have seen but, it better. I could right. have, uh, here's right. the red flags, that kind of thing. But, but the, law is, the law is negative, so we can be positive. Right. 
That's what it's for. We don't have it. So you're in, stuck in the position of having to go, I have to fix the negatives. You do not. The law is supposed to. Your ethic is supposed to. Your culture is supposed to. The people around you are supposed to. They don't. They are, but you, don't, you don't get truth without duty. It's truth and duty before face because nothing else, like, it doesn't stand up on its own. It, re it requires being bolstered. But so, long as, but so long as there is positive, there's also going to be negative. I mean, it's just unavoidable. So um, like the old fashioned way, like like the negativity of young men, you know, just their, the violence and just rowdiness and so forth, yet they would just channel that into a more or less wholesome avenue like like athletics or, or even like joining the military when you're young or something like that so um you know they're not just uh out getting in getting in fights or you know gang violence or anything like that so that was that that's an important thing to me is realizing that there's always going to be negativity i mean so long as you got positivity it's got to be balanced out because you can't have a coin with one side and um so just trying to come up with more or less wholesome approaches for channeling the negativity. And I've even considered, um, I wouldn't at all be opposed to like voluntary gladiatorial combat or bringing back dueling or anything, yeah. something like that. Yeah. As long as it's voluntary. I, I think I wanna underline what Brandon's point was. Uh, Pana, you went the direction like, it's gonna always be this. Uh, and then he was stating, unless we have a rule set and that's what, uh, most of the guys in our circle came from propertarian institute and studying propertarianism which is the application of the scientific method on social sciences and we've already had these gladiatorial king of the hill games for uh, intellectual subjects to get some degree of resolution we feel that we've got to a point of of natural law reciprocity and defining it as voluntary productive uh, fully informed, warranted, and free from the imposition of costs on others. If you can abide by those, then the uh, that's like the rule set. That's the operating system. And this is what we're leaning towards having implemented from probably local levels on up, especially if we, if we move into a great offset or a separation, speciation, uh, kind of thing. We want people to agree to abide by this more explicit rule set. So that's what Brandon was underlying is that we can break the weak man, strong man uh, uh, wheel by abiding by and enforcing reciprocity because the key is it's truly scalable. Uh, and if you abide by it, everybody can have more. It's like a bigger pie uh, for people. So either you can chime in on that or or not, but I do wanted to wanted to share that with you. Well, uh, it seems like in the olden days that you had like um, a cultural way of getting rid of the strong man, weak man. Uh, what would it be the, the the polarity or something? Just by um, something like weakness or cowardice was just intolerable in a man, you know, up until modern times. And now it's, it's rewarded, you know, it's like, uh, if, you, if you're like sensitive and cry and, you know, blame Whitey for your troubles or whatever, then uh, then you get points for that. But um, yeah, it's that's just uh, a recipe for disaster in a, a civilization where actual seen seen as some sort of sin. Go ahead, Martin. That's what happens when you're ruled by a woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, bless their hearts, they want safety more than freedom. It's like just the, I mean, even this is politically incorrect even to say that there are psychological differences between men and women, but uh, women, I mean, they're more concerned with security than men are and are willing, more willing to sacrifice rights and freedoms for the sake of that. So that when they're when they're voting, when they're when half of the votes are coming from women, like returning to a strong society is uh, 
definitely got uh, the card stacked against it. You may just have to wait for enough of a collapse that uh, women are deprived of voting again. Yeah. The result is that matriarchies are always more tyrannical. Yep. They have to be to guarantee that security that they're clamoring for. Uh, real quick, uh, Ox Stone asked about having a uh, Telegram, a dedicated time for a Telegram chat, like if we had to ask me anything or that we're on there. I would recommend we uh, shoot for that same Tuesday slot. We haven't been recording our pre-records, though we might come up with something. I think a lot just uh, is predicated on this road trip and trying to find a location where we could actually have a studio we do want to have more higher production content. Um, we have a lot of capable men, and we have good ideas. We we need to have a location, uh, have men join, and start really rolling out all of our good ideas. Uh, I do need to finish up the road trip, get get a meta understanding of all the locations, and then the best one, the best fit, the best opportunity, and also in the macro environment is if the economy crashes. I don't want to be buying anything topish, but all of that being said, we are looking, you know, we're making progress. Um, and so I would throw out Tuesdays at this five Eastern, uh, we could be on the telegram for good dudes and um, uh, be lively there for a little while until we pick up on a, doing pre-record shows again, of which Nick suggested Kurt wants to do a theory of everything series where we pick apart uh, other scientists, philosophers, theories of everything, including Chris Langan and Ken Wilbur. And um, I guess he has some comments on that. So try to catch us, I guess, guys, let's next, next Tuesday for Ox Stone. Let's try to be available on Telegram and make it an active spot. Absolutely. Really appreciate the chat today, guys. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Really beneficial. I'd love to. I'd love to see. I'd love to see you come back. I appreciated you, you spending some time with us today. Yeah, it's and, been a good time. Yeah, thanks for coming on, Pano. No, you're welcome. Okay, Nick, take us out. All right. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for tuning in to the Good News Show. We really do appreciate Pano coming on and talking with us and sharing some of his insights with us. Uh, if you did get something out of this show, if you liked it, please, in reciprocity, share the link to the channel with a friend or your family or everybody. Uh, thank you, guys. Please do make sure to hit the like thing, too. That does help boost our signal in the algorithm a little bit. And uh, have a good day, everyone. Thank you. We will catch you guys next time on The Good Dude Show next Friday, 5 Eastern. Bye.